Welcome back to the second video in what we're calling the Frequency Trilogy series. If you missed the first video, it was about low end and you can check it out in the pop-out link above. In this video, I'm gonna be discussing mid-range frequencies and explaining how to handle them. I'll reference various audio concepts, acoustic and psychoacoustic principles, and other topics covered in the low end video. I'm gonna be using some nectar, neutron, and tonal balance control. So head to the description to download free trials and follow along. Enough said, let's get started. Where would we be without the mids? It sounds like a silly question, but the mids make up the identity of any sound source. In fact, I'll play a couple of tracks for you and let's see if you can identify the instrument with all the low and high mids removed. Moonlit play, we couldn't wait another day. So those with discerning ears might have known which track was which, but I bet for some of you out there, it was a challenge. You might've heard the expression, the music is in the mids. This is because in that mid frequency cluster, you have the fundamental frequency and the associated frequencies known as the harmonics, which give identity to the sound source, allowing the listener to identify with confidence just what it is they're hearing. When we take away those elements with an EQ, as I did, I must admit in a very extreme fashion, or if competing mix elements are masking the mid frequencies, it becomes difficult for the listener to understand what's going on as now the mix lacks definition and separation. So if it isn't obvious in this video, I'm really going to try to get you to care about mid frequencies as much as I know you care about lows and highs. So let me lay out my case with some basic facts. Of all the frequency clusters that make up the tonal balance of a track, the mids come through the clearest on headphones and earbuds, which makes up the majority of listening devices. Mid-range frequencies often contain the fundamental frequencies and harmonics of vocals, guitars, drums, and more. Don't believe me? Ban past any great mix from the last 20 years, scooping out the very lows and the very highs, and the mix will still sound pretty solid. But omit the mids and leave in the lows and highs and the entire song disappears. A beautifully mixed mid-range is the bridge between the low end and the high end frequencies. A mix with patches in this area from undermixed or poorly mixed instruments can crumble the track. And finally, mid-range frequencies more than low and high frequencies contribute to the presence and definition of instruments and vocals. Not understanding how to treat these elements with your tools can damage the effectiveness of your mix. Hopefully I've laid out the case for why you should care about the mids. But before we get into the main parts of this video, let's define our terms so that we're all on the same page with where the mids are and which instruments tend to fall within that very important range. So in the first video, we determined that the lows covered zero to 250 Hertz on the spectrum of human hearing. So where do those mids come in? Well, there's actually two areas of mid-range energy that mixing and mastering engineers refer to, low mids and high mids. Low mids start where the lows end, so from 250 to 2K. And the high mids or upper mids run from 2K to around 6K. Unlike the lows in the video we covered last time, many if not all instruments fall into this range, making it a challenge to have everything beautifully represented, a bit like a family photo where you've got 20 plus people and you have to find a way to make sure that everyone can be seen from the little old ladies to the super tall basketball players in this hypothetical family. So now that we have an understanding of where the mid-range falls and the range of human hearing, let's talk specifically about how we hear stuff in the middle territory. If you watched the previous video we did on low end, you'll remember that as humans, we're particularly sensitive to frequencies that this video is all about. If we pull up the equal loudness curve image again, you'll see the roll off occurring in the lows and the highs. Starting at the lower end of the mids, the 250 to 2K range, 
This territory can sometimes contain the fundamental frequency of instruments as well as low order harmonics that make up the timbre of the instruments. Now, when I say timbre, I'm referring to the harmonics that follow the fundamental. Timbre is critical to helping you understand what the source of the sound is, a guitar, a vocal, a kazoo. If we can't make out the harmonics or if we can hear them, but we can't hear the fundamental frequency, we have a really hard time understanding just what it is we're listening to. From around 2K to 6K is where we find the high mids, or again, upper mids. This range is the stuff we humans are very interested in and sensitive to. Information in this area contains complex harmonics, and the stuff up here is said to be crucial to definition, presence, and overall intelligibility. So if we go back to our what's louder example from the previous video, remember we had that 50 hertz tone, and the 2.5 kilohertz tone. The 2.5 kilohertz tone is definitely something that we perceive as louder. Therefore, it gets a higher, remember we deal in negative numbers in audio, loudness units full scale value, even though it played back at minus 10 RMS, the same loudness as the 50 hertz tone. The reason that we're so sensitive to this range is because our auditory system is highly attuned to perceiving sounds within it. This sensitivity is partly due to the resonant properties of the ear canal and the ear's middle ear system. You might notice that really important sounds in your world fall within this range. For example, the wail of an ambulance siren or the cry of a baby or the bark of a golden retriever puppy. Do you want to bark? So mid-range matters, but how does it make a difference in my mix? Will I have to turn down everything in that 250 to 6K range? Well, it should come as no surprise that prolonged exposure to high levels of mid-range frequencies can cause listening fatigue and even discomfort in some people. This is especially true if frequencies are excessively boosted or even if the mix lacks proper balance across the entire frequency spectrum. After all, mid-range frequencies play a crucial role in the intelligibility and clarity of speech, as well as in the richness and presence of musical instruments. So if you turn that stuff down, you risk reducing definition and clarity. The other risk to turning mid-range frequencies down too low is that you negatively affect the listener's ability to localize mid-range sources. When sounds contain significant mid-range information, our ears can more accurately pinpoint their source. Okay, that was a lot. So let's summarize before we move to the next section. Humans are sensitive to mid-range frequencies, which are crucial for understanding the source and timbre of sounds. Mid-range encompasses the lower 250 to 2K and upper 2K to 6K regions, impacting definition, presence, and intelligibility. Excessive mid-range exposure can lead to listening fatigue. So this is why a balanced mix is important. Mid-range frequencies contribute to speech clarity, instrument richness, and sound localization. So reducing mid-range excessively can hinder definition and localization. So now that we understand a little more about how we hear mid-range, let's pivot to the role your room and speakers play in affecting the way you hear it. Now, when thinking about investing in monitors for solid mid-range representation, you might remember that in the last video we did on low-end, I said those Oratone Cubes or Yamaha NS10s would be insufficient for your low-end needs. But you know what they're totally sufficient for? Mid-range power. I'm not saying go out and buy some Cubes or NS10s, but if you have a little extra cash, they're a pretty great option if you're interested in really zeroing in on the range we're discussing today, or at least they're great for offering a second opinion on the mids if you're lucky enough to own two sets of monitors, one pair that faithfully represents the full range and another that spotlights the mids, like the Cubes or NS10s. You'll probably have an easier time getting your hands on some Cubes, which are still in production, unlike the NS10s, whose materials eventually became unavailable, leading Yamaha to discontinue them a little over 20 years ago. A quick word though about those eager to take the plunge for some NS10s or cubes. Both loudspeakers I mentioned are passive, meaning they don't have an amplifier built into their design, which is going to power them. I should note that there exists an active version of the cubes, but let's say you want to be the cork sniffer and get that passive version. You'll need an extra amplifier if you want to get sound out of them. Now, I cannot overstate the importance of pairing the right amplifier to the NS10s or to the cubes. And this is because the overall sound of the loudspeaker is really influenced by that external amplifier. 
the interaction between an amp and a loudspeaker is a cohesive system where the amplifier plays a crucial role in shaping various aspects of the sound like transient response, the low-end frequency reproduction, and even distortion. So do a little research in the forums, look for recommendations on amp and loudspeaker pairings to make sure that you're getting the perfect match. If you're looking for a good single set of loudspeakers that represent the mid-range, you might be wondering, should I go for a two-way or three-way loudspeaker design? Loudspeakers use multiple drivers to ensure that each driver handles specific frequencies that it specializes in reproducing. A crossover is used to split the incoming signal into different frequency bands, typically around 2K for a two-way loudspeaker. Due to the limitations of crossovers, there's always some overlapping bandwidth where identical frequencies are sent to both drivers, introducing certain phase issues that can affect the sound quality. Can a two-way speaker accurately represent the mid-range or do I have to buy a three-way system with a dedicated cone, sometimes called a squeaker or mid-woofer to keep with the animal theme? Olive? So I'm here to tell you that two-way studio monitors are totally capable of faithfully reproducing the audible spectrum, especially the mids, so you don't need to break the bank on a three-way system necessarily. If you do want to go for a three-way design, just know they require really careful, smart design and integration to really optimize the performance of each driver and maintain really great and accurate phase coherence. I'm saying this because a studio quality two-way design will often perform better than a commercial or bookshelf three-way design. If you intend to level up to a studio quality three-way design, they'll most certainly come at a higher cost compared to the two-way studio systems. All right, that was a lot. So let's summarize again before we move on. Oratone Cubes and Yamaha NS10s are suitable for mid-range representation and can even be used as secondary monitors. While pairing an amplifier to a passive speaker, the choice of amp significantly affects the overall sound characteristics. Two-way monitors can competently reproduce the mid-range, obviating the need for a three-way system for those on more of a budget. Three-way systems minimize distortion and ensure distinct mix elements. Now, just as we mentioned in the earlier video, great monitors are useless without great room treatment. When sound leaves the loudspeakers, it interacts with the room, creating room modes and standing waves. To treat those two problems, you need materials that absorb and diffuse sound reflections. As you'll remember from the last video, direct sound is accompanied by these reflections that bounce off nearby surfaces, resulting in a blending effect. These reflections, traveling a longer distance, arrive at a specific phase relationship to the direct sound. The shorter wavelengths of mid and high frequencies make them more susceptible to issues caused by these reflections. Now within the initial 40 milliseconds, early reflections occur and give rise to comb filtering, which is characterized by boosts and or cancellations across the perceived frequency response. Additionally, the delayed arrival of direct sound and its reflections can lead to a kind of smearing of the stereo image. Common sources of reflections include uh, your desk, sidewalls, and even the ceiling. You've probably actually already felt the power of these reflections in your own space or somewhere like in a movie theater. When the sound is cranked and it's bouncing off the walls and into your ears, these reflections almost make you feel like you're soaked in noise, which is why we love to turn things up nice and loud, creating the feeling of being at a concert or a live event where the sound is washing over you. It's for this reason that mix engineers often recommend checking the mix at quiet levels to reduce the influence of the room entirely and allow as direct a representation of the audio as possible. When you listen at quiet levels, you don't allow the standing waves, room modes, any kind of comb filtering to play a role in shaping the tone of the music. For those who like to listen loud, and that's me, use absorbers designed to suppress sound reflections impact. Since the mids are often problematic, the absorbers don't need to be too deep. Usually around 50 millimeters of acoustic foam is all you need. For those interested in using headphones to dial in their mid-range, it's important to avoid consumer headphones as they tend to alter the sound, changing the audio which leads to poor decision making during the mixing and mastering phase. Opting instead for studio quality wired headphones is ideal as they provide a more neutral mid-range sound. 
And I say wired because at the time of this video anyway, Bluetooth does not natively support lossless audio transmission, meaning Bluetooth is gonna discard some important audio information for the sake of transmitting sound more efficiently. The choice of studio grade headphones with or without an accompanying amplifier is entirely up to you. And I'd recommend that you don't just buy whatever your favorite engineer or producer owns. Unlike studio monitors, auditioning multiple sets of headphones in an audio shop is so much easier. So bring a device that plays high fidelity audio and create a playlist of familiar mixes to carefully evaluate the sound as you audition your next set of great headphones. Now, additionally, it's worth noting that room correction software can also affect the EQ profile of loudspeakers and headphones, allowing you to hear mid-range a little better. If this interests you, that kind of software is totally recommended. Let's summarize again. Great monitors require proper room treatment to address sound interactions within that room. Sound reflections can be treated using materials that absorb and diffuse them. Early reflections can cause comb filtering, stereo image smearing, and can be sourced from surfaces like the desk, sidewalls, and ceiling. Loud listening can be influenced by the room reflections. Quiet levels minimize their impact. Studio quality headphones are preferable for mid-range calibration. Avoid consumer headphones that alter the sound. Auditioning multiple sets of headphones is easier than studio monitors in stores using high fidelity audio and familiar mixes. And finally, room correction software can impact loudspeakers and headphones, providing a balanced sonic output. So give it a shot. So now that we've covered how our ears perceive the mids and how they're reproduced from the monitors and then translated into a room, let's get a grip on how to control them in the digital environment. While there are many ways to manipulate the mids to suit your sonic goals, such as compression, distortion, and more, perhaps the best tool for the most direct control is an equalizer. An equalizer is a tool that we use to manipulate the frequency components of different mix elements. The key to deploying EQ effectively is to understand each instrument's frequency characteristics, especially the mids, and how it fits into the overall mix composition. As a reminder, the low mids encompass roughly 250 to 2K and fundamental harmonics of diverse instruments and a big part of their timbre. The high mids or upper mids, 2K to 6K, we think of this range as linked to loudness, definition, presence, and speech intelligibility. It's important to note that when you're using EQ, it's good to have a sense of just why it is you're making moves in the first place. Do you want to make the track sound big, small, edgy, round, clear, muddy? Do you want to take energy from something and give it to something else? Are you trying to impart a vibe or a feeling with EQ? Whatever your sonic goals, getting there requires boosting and or cutting with an EQ, and I'd argue that it's cutting, not boosting, that will offer you the best results, making something sound better than it did before. So what do I mean by sound better? Engineers like to listen for problematic frequencies and carve those away to make the track sound more like itself, more defined, or more clear. Now the moves I'll soon suggest won't be applicable to literally everyone's mix. My goal is just to give you ideas for how to manipulate the mids with an EQ and get you thinking about the role this frequency range plays in affecting your mixing work. Now the name of the game is gonna be gentle reduction and suppression of the mids. And when I say gentle, uh, I mean it. Remember, music is in the mids. Too much scooping in this region leaves the tracks and overall mix feeling brittle and can ruin their definition and presence. Let's showcase a few common instruments and talk about how to control and hear their mid-range content. A common attribute of acoustic guitars is that there's a lot of boomy low-end buildup, especially in the low mids. In commercial mixes, the soul of the guitar, made up of those same mids I just mentioned, is often rolled off considerably so that the guitar plays more of a rhythmic, textured role. However, in intimate ballads, where it's just a guitar and vocals, the low mids are still sheared, though not as drastically, and this is to allow the singer to own that territory. Whatever the case may be, let me show you that by using a parametric EQ, I can choose a node in the low mid region contributing to that boominess and muddiness to bring more attention to the very low end of the body and to bring attention to the upper mids too, thus refining the guitar and bringing clarity and definition to it through middle management.
So it's important to take into account what we just heard. By removing some of the body and rumble of the guitar, we've spotlit the presence more in the 4 to 5k region, as well as a sparkle at the very top end around 10 to 20k. And we did that without any boosting, right? This is what using an EQ for definition is all about, cutting to make things sound a little better than they did before. If you want to get a little more gutsy with the mid-range on a guitar, try boosting the upper mids from anywhere to 1 to 5k to give more presence to the instrument. And I should mention, it's really important to check your work not just in solo, but also in the context of the entire mix, and keep an ear out for whether the moves are hurting or helping the overall mix. In the mixing world, vocals are famous for being challenging to cut and sculpt into something that sounds better. An upper and lower mid energy is equally as notorious to control, but you'll need to get a grip on it sooner or later, so let's discuss. Muddiness, think 100 to 600 hertz, and honkiness, think 500 to 2k, in the low and high mids is critical to control and almost always a great idea to attenuate with an EQ. The gender of the singer matters very little here, as these areas are often a problem no matter who is in front of the mic. And sibilance, those pesky sch sounds, often reach into the upper mid territory as well, so a de -esser, which is essentially a multiband compressor and comes standard in Nectar is often better suited than an EQ for this challenge. So let's call up an EQ and apply some gentle attenuation to those regions to see if we can't make something sound better than it did before. You spend all your time hanging on To a yesterday that's dead and gone It's hard time you get to moving on Believe it or not you're right where you belong Some days are easy, some days are tough You're the only one to know when you've had enough Some days are easy, some days are tough Some days are easy, some days are tough You've got your reasons for giving up It's the same old situation with your dumb, dumb luck Another key area for the mid-range is in the upper mids in the 2 to 4k range. This is a really magical spectral area for vocals as a little boost here can make the singer sound like they're stepping forward and sound even closer to the listener. Let's perform some moves and see if we can leave the vocal better than we found it. It's the same old situation with your dumb dumb love. You spend all your time hanging on. Some days are easy, some days are tough You're the only one to know when you've had enough You've got your reasons for giving up It's the same old situation with your dumb, dumb love So far, we've EQ'd individual instruments, but what about working on a vocal and a guitar at the same time? As a general rule, it's critical that the vocals overpower any element that's masking them. When multiple elements vie for the same frequency range, distinguishing one from another becomes challenging, and we might miss out on vital timbral elements or specific notes. So let's now revisit those two tracks without changing the important EQ work that we already did, but just try to achieve a little more separation, especially in the mids. You've had enough, you've got your reasons for giving up. It's the same old situation with your dumb, dumb love You spend all your time hanging on To it yesterday that's dead and gone Some days are easy, some days are tough You're the only one to know when you've had enough You've got your reasons for giving up it's the same old situation with your dumb, dumb love You spend all your time hanging on To it yesterday that's dead and gone It's high time you get to moving on Believe it or not, you're right where you belong 
That's how to negotiate masking issues between two tracks. But what about untangling multiple tracks across an entire mix for great tonal balance? Well, if you're ever in doubt about the health of the tonal balance of your entire session, park tonal balance control on your master bus. Just as I mentioned in the previous video, tonal balance control is a great way to assess how healthy the distribution of energy is from the lows all the way to the highs. Just to put this in perspective, our individual track EQing that we did earlier is like using Street View in Google Maps. And tonal balance control is like zooming out to Earth View, so you can really see what's happening in a global sense. A lopsided frequency response is hard to hide from the listener, even if they're using cheap commercial headphones or loudspeakers. Now, one of the contributing factors to mixes that sound lopsided, uneven, or not fully cooked is when the bass is way too heavy or the highs are way too sharp. Over the top lows or piercing highs is what tonal balance control is designed to show you at a bird's eye view. In this scenario, the mix engineers overemphasize the low end without ensuring that that bridge from the low mids to the upper mids all the way to the highs has been constructed. In mixing, we can help to construct this bridge by listening to the mix and taking a look at tonal balance control and then using tools just like EQ to extend or curtail mix elements that are overlapping in areas that they shouldn't be, or by drawing out additional spectral material, a kind of creative connective tissue between instruments from the lows to the highs. Now, knowing just where the gaps in the pathway are on this connective bridge will take some experience and practice, but calling up the fine view will give you some clues in tonal balance control. Look for areas where there are significant dips or valleys, if you will, where energy is lacking or missing altogether. And know that this missing energy could be due to masking issues more than instruments that don't present well natively in that particular region. Consider using an EQ to draw out that energy. Now, unfortunately, you can't add what's not already there with an EQ. So if that's the case, try to use harmonic enhancers like saturation or distortion to create new spectral information if need be. Ideally, the lows should be under control through careful EQ management and unmasking. The bridge from the lows to the highs using all the stuff in the mids should help to bind the instruments together into something cohesive and balanced. So your mix looks less like this, or this, and more like this. And the key to getting this mix, in my view, is ultimately solid control of that mid-range. Finally, if the mids are hidden or present as holes along that bridge, Sometimes bringing them up and down at the individual track level isn't always the answer. Sometimes to uncover them, you simply have to lower the low end. The same subtractive EQ principle we employed on individual tracks applies here on the larger mix. By removing, we can reveal and make something sound better. A careful reduction of low end can help the mids perk up and be heard, which can influence the overall tonal balance for the better. Let's summarize one more time. An equalizer is a powerful tool for manipulating mid-range frequencies in the digital environment. Understanding each instrument's EQ characteristics, especially in the mids, is crucial for effective EQ deployment. The low mids, 250 to 2K, consist of fundamental harmonics shaping the essence and tonal character of instruments. The high mids, 2K to 6K, are sensitive frequencies associated with loudness, impact, definition, presence, and speech intelligibility. Removing boominess and muddiness in the low mids can bring clarity and definition to instruments like acoustic guitars, vocals, and honestly, so much more. Masking issues can occur when multiple instruments vie for the same frequency range but you can mitigate this by removing unnecessary frequencies and achieving clear separation. Build the bridge from the lows to the low mids by careful management of the overall mid range. And solving masking issues is also gonna play a big part in great tonal balance. And there you have it. In this exploration of the mid range, we've discovered their crucial role in shaping instrument identity and presence in a mix. 
We've learned about how our ears perceive the mids, the influence of monitors and room acoustics on mid-range content, and the powerful impact of EQ in controlling these frequencies. We've hopefully seen how EQ can enhance instrument clarity and definition, ultimately improving the whole mix overall. And we've learned about building that critical mid-range bridge, which can help contribute to an overall healthy tonal balance. In the next and final part of the series, we're going to be exploring the world of high frequency content. So stay tuned for more insights and tips to help you craft exceptional mixes. And as always, happy mixing.